Hello and welcome. Here we are on behalf of the Queer Among Institute, our board of directors, our advisors, volunteers, supporters. We just want to welcome you in general to our Q&A lecturing series. Um, it's within the mission of the Institute to balance out our own experiential research with the academic understanding that's available to us today. Uh, Dr. Goodman provided us with a roadmap of how someone with a scientific approach can delve into the world of direct experience. And no educational institute can thrive alone. It's an open approach. And so we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to broaden the scope of our research and our understanding and our exploration. And as a global family, we're staying connected to each other. So it's a good time for that, it's critical. And on the positive side of things, we're using technology to expand our community and, uh, and continue the conversation. So today we have very special guests. And to introduce them, let me turn it over to my wife, who's, who is the Director of Research and, and Outreach and oh. Development, Laura Lee. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> we're, we're very glad to welcome today's special guest. They've got stories to share about a very special place. We all travel so widely to sacred places, ancient places where our collective ancestors have made their mark, revealing a relationship to the world that we can only hope to someday regain in some small part to deepen our relationship to our planet and to the universe at large. We travel widely and then we happily find that among today's, uh, the world's sacred places and extraordinary cultures, that they're here too in our own backyard here in America. One of those places is Chaco Canyon. New Mexico is rich in culture and the remains and the artifacts and the descendants who are carrying on the vibrant, dynamic and resplendent cultures and adding to it. Chaco Canyon, so unique, so complex, so vast, mysterious, and layered, it doesn't easily give up its secrets. Chaco was one of the first places that Paul and I visited on our first journeys to the American Southwest. It's not easy to get to, down miles of desolate road, to a remote canyon. You need three days to explore all the most accessible buildings. We were then with friends who said, oh, you have to go on GB's Archaeo astronomy tour if you really want to understand what this place is. And so among keyhole doors and thousand year old timbers, three, four, sometimes five stories, uh, some with balconies that still stand, um, finely laid stone walls, huge ceremonial kivas, niches, wide plazas, vistas, canyon walls that hug these huge complexes, these uh, labyrinth of uh, stone block rooms, we got a hint, a hint of the relationships and alignments, building to building, to sun, to moon, to a rich and sophisticated cosmology that GB imparted. Who built this? Who designed it? Why? With what purpose? Why there? GP Cornucopia and Sherilyn Morrow, a dynamic research team, are here to answer this and more. GB has been the principal interpretive ranger at Chaco 33 years. Research that he's done, what it's meant to him over the course of his professional and personal life there, uh, and the continuing research that he's done with solar astrophysicist Sherilyn Morrow. She too has spent decades studying Chaco in depth. Uh, and Sherilyn, we've had the pleasure of getting to know her for a week at our institute. We thank Tony Hull, astrophysicist, for the introductions. Um, they are here to join us uh, in quite the presentation and discussion of this extraordinary place. So welcome, you two. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like us to begin the sharing? Well, okay. actually, tell us a little bit about how you met, a little bit about your time there, how you landed at Chaco. Uh, tell us a bit, a bit about, your, about your personal journey your that personal brought you journey. there. You, let's start well, with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I went to Chaco for the first time in 1986 as a visitor. I was new to New Mexico and had heard about Chaco 
from several different people who said I needed to go. Um, I had also heard about it from Carl Sagan's TV series, Cosmos. Several uh, segments were filmed there, and one of them attracted me, a painting at the uh, uh, west end of the canyon that might have been, or might be, a rendition of the supernova in uh, 1054. We know the people saw that supernova. It was extraordinary. And they may have painted it, and I had to go and see it. And the first thing that struck me was the remoteness of the canyon and uh, how dark the sky is. So I started going up there camping, like every other weekend practically, and taking my telescope. And uh, the next year I decided uh, I would volunteer. So this was 1988 now. And uh, I was the first campground host. So I lived in the campground among the uh, visitors and got to know the park even more. And the next year I became a seasonal ranger starting in eight, uh, 1989, and did that for about six, seven years, and then became a permanent. I just couldn't get enough of Chaco. So since 1988, uh, I have lived and worked in the canyon. And then about 15 years ago, Sherry Lynn showed up. I'll let her tell her story, but she came as part of an educational outreach program through NASA, where she was working with the indigenous people in the surrounding area. Uh, teaching uh, science and approaches to science and she heard about Chaco and came to visit and then that was a done deal so then we've been uh, uh, meeting there and other places ever since and uh, she is probably the second longest interpreter in the canyon so she's been doing that for about 15 years uh, besides myself other interpreters come and go within two or three years and she's also been on a research team and has developed her own um, research and ideas about Chaco, which she will tell you about today. Ah, That's wonderful. my story. Thank you. And Sherilyn, your story a bit more. Well, uh, when I first called up a fellow named G.B. Cornucopia, um, you know, whose name was like, really? <laughs> yeah, G.B. his name is <laughs> Uh, I called him up. He didn't know me from Adam. I had gotten a recommendation from NASA colleagues uh, that, hey, this is the guy to talk to down there. Uh, and uh, he basically was just treating me like a soulmate from the very beginning conversation. So um, I made the mistake of going to Chaco for a few hours the first time I went there. Um, and we stayed up late into the night, so uh, uh, resonating. Through GB, I was able to connect to some research teams and went out. I'm an astronomer. I'm a, I'm a PhD astronomer. I'm supposed to know about astronomy, but what I was missing was the naked eye astronomy. What I was missing is going out there myself and watching the moon rise. And uh, so GB connected me to a number of archaeoastronomy and archaeology teams and through those experiences I was going out at night in the canyon um, seeing unbelievable stars watching a moonrise simple thing it, it's a it happens every month and we don't I wasn't paying attention right and I was connected to at the time a mission of the world you know some of the world's best explorers NASA funded explorers of the moon and I asked them some things about basic naked eye moon watching uh, at a conference, and none of them knew what I was talking about, right? And I confess that I got a PhD in astrophysics, solar astrophysics, and did not understand the phases of the moon, okay? And so this is part of our, our you know, our Western training. It, it doesn't ask us, it doesn't invite us to that connection with the natural world that's so, that's so vital and so important. And so, uh, I had a, a Paul, listening to your a description of your epiphany, there was that similar kind of epiphany, awakening, that there is something here that I've been missing and that I want to reconnect with uh, in regards to that deeper connection with the, the natural environment and the astronomy uh, in particular that's accessible uh, to uh, uh, a visit to Chaco, and of course, the same as GB loves to say in on his programs. You know, the the it's the same sky, folks, that the Chacoans saw a thousand years ago, mm. right? You you feel this kind of connection across space, time, and culture there 
that is, uh, is, is very potent. And it's one of the, the most marvelous laboratory I've ever experienced for, for teaching basic astronomical understanding and weaving together the modern and um, ancient techniques of observing the sky. So that, that's, that is an ongoing uh, passion for me. Uh, and in working with GB is a marvelous support of both education and uh, research teams. And the PUNCH mission that will study the solar corona, I'm writing an outreach and communication plan for it. And it will include not just learning about NASA heliophysics, but also an invitation to this first person sun watching. Um, through an eclipse petroglyph that we hope to tell you about later in the presentation. Oh, Beautiful. exciting. Because it's the passion and the majesty and the deep understanding of the universes that we're all about. Back to so, the experiential. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, now we're ready for your presentation. So all unless right. there's anything else you want to add up front here. We'll add it during yeah. the presentation. Oh, no, no, it's beautiful. I mean, that is the, the, the residence with you all coming out to the Institute for that, that week a couple of years ago and seeing, you know, that the, the labyrinth and the gnomon and right. I mean, that kind of first person engagement is quite, quite beautiful. And I know that's a piece of what, what you're uh, doing there. Let me get to the screen and make sure I'm on the right one this time. Not that one, but this one. Okay, great. And I'll start with that. And I am um, screen. And there's the pussycat out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And there you are. Right. Is that? Yes, we're both in Chaco in different uh, places. Uh, GB, I think you were at Casa Rinconada where Paul had his epiphany. That's right. This was uh, one of the sunsets, uh, sunrises rather. Uh, I don't know if this was uh, equinox sunrise or summer solstice sunrise, but at the Great Kiva, we have morning presentations uh, at, at those times that bring hundreds of people to see it. Mm. And uh, just to watch the sun rise anywhere in Chaco is, is almost an epiphany in and of itself. But on these special days when the buildings actually are marked in such a way to tell time, to, to designate those special times when the sun stops and then before it turns around again and starts its uh, southern trek or whichever direction it's going. Um, so the, this is not my favorite picture of me, but it is GB's, one of GB's favorite pictures. One of my favorites. Right? This was a, a very memorable time when I was privileged to do a kinesthetic astronomy program, an embodied astronomy program, uh, in the largest room of Pueblo Bonito, which GB will be telling you about uh, later on. And so uh, let's, uh, again, we've, uh, we've talked about our introductions. We won't uh, dwell here, um, but we do have those uh, for you. Um, and this is my favorite picture of me, made by GB in Chaco Canyon, uh, a touch the rainbow. I'm, I'm much older now, as you can see, but I don't think I'll ever stop using this photograph because it's just it's such a, a happy memory and there have been many of those uh, in, in Chaco. I, I grew up wanting to go to the moon like the Apollo astronauts. Um, I've not made that, although other women will uh, in the coming decade uh, in the Artemis program. Uh, Chaco has been my moon, right? Chaco is my, the equivalent of my uh, exploratory uh, self, both in an inner and outer sense. Okay, so I think we've covered one in spades. Um, I just am going to have a couple of slides and we will have contextual slides for you. This is a little bit our plan. It will go faster than all six of those things, but um, just for those of you who have not had a chance to look at those videos, and uh, I encourage you uh, to, to do so. Um, uh, the uh, GB will uh, speak a little bit about the lessons of Pueblo Benito, which is the really the one of the prime reasons that Chaco Canyon is a World Heritage Site. Um, and uh, so it is the largest and most excavated of the, of the buildings. Uh, in Chaco. Uh, then uh, rooted in my research with GB's encouragement, I developed an interpretive program around the region between 
the two largest great houses in Chaco Canyon, and that's what we mean by the center place. And then I'd like to share something in light of the two upcoming eclipses in the, the coming decade, right? Uh, we have an annular eclipse in 2023, and we have a total solar eclipse in 2024, both of them visible over the United States. And so there's a very special petroglyph on a panel that also has rock art related to uh, the posture that you all used the, the other day. And so there's an eclipse petroglyph and also uh, this, so that will be a place to, to inject uh, that connection uh, for you all. Um, and then of course, what, however you'd like to handle the discussion, okay? Oh. Uh, so here we are, the red circle in the center, their circle, the green, it represents the area of Chaco Culture National Historical Park, which is in the Four Corners region. Uh, Colorado is up here, uh, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. So this is the Four Corners region where four southwestern states come together. And this is the basic location in the northwestern corner of New Mexico. This is a, a Chaco outlier called Chimney Rock there. And this is an aerial view of Pueblo Bonito, uh, a very uh, uh, stunning example of uh, the Chaco buildings. Uh, I, maybe I think uh, you could speak a little bit about those red dots, yeah? Yeah, the red dots are what we call outliers. Chaco, um, when you think about Chaco, the canyon was a tiny part of it. It was the beginning. About 850 AD, we start to see the construction of large buildings. Uh, and over time, the, about 300 years, they expanded out over an area about 60, 70,000 square miles. And there are over 200 of these buildings. Uh, Bonito is the largest, but some of them rival Bonito. And uh, roads, uh, connections uh, between them uh, are found on the landscape, still visible. And uh, this was uh, something that provided a very large uh, population with a center place. Most people associated with Chaco did not live there. Uh, it seems to have been a gathering place. And there are a lot of questions about what those gatherings were about. But the connections between Chaco and the outliers uh, are still visible on the landscape. Because I'm an inveterate um, educator and wanting to invite you to your own first person experiences of extraordinary astronomical phenomena, as the Chacoans did, I want to point out that from 2023 to 2026, a northernmost full moonrise will appear between the pillars of this chimney rock, which is about a hundred miles as the crow flies uh, to the northeast of Chaco. And so this architecture is similar in nature, which connects it culturally to the center place of, of, of Chaco. So only every 18.6 years does a full moonrise come between those pillars from this Puebloan structure, from the alignment with this Puebloan structure up on a very high ridge in Chimney Rock. So just a little FYI that the coming decade is extraordinary with eclipses at a time of high solar activity and also a so-called major lunar standstill where the full moon will you know, appear through structures like this. The building date of that structure uh, coincides uh, with that lunar cycle. So it seems that these people were very much interested in that. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably the chief place of evidence, aside from Casa Rinconada, uh, which, uh, okay, so on we go. Uh, that's just a, an, an elaboration of the, the vastness of the Chaco phenomenon, as some will call it. Each one of those little uh, rectangles is a great house, and each one of the triangles is a great kiva. So you can see the part of the, uh, the canyon. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, this is the canyon and it's stock full of those buildings. But as you can see, many more exist outside. Wow. There's again, the four corners area. So of course they didn't have states right back then. And so it's, it's this general region. All right, so, <clears throat> so there, if you come as a visitor, you'll see a sign uh, like that. I'm curious, 
how many, maybe Paul and Laura, you can tell us, uh, raise your hand if you've been to Chaco culture. Can we get a sense of, uh, you know, of people either raising their hands or motioning to you? Can you give us an idea? I yeah, wanna... yeah. The, uh, since we have it on slide mode, I can't see their hands. Oh, you can't see. Okay. We'll later. do that afterwards. And yeah. people can also pay, make a note in the chat room and say, yes, I've been there. Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. That, that, yeah. That would be good. You just write in the yeah, write in the chat. Yes, no, um, and then you could give us that data because it'd be kind of fun to know as we're going along here. Sure. Um, okay. Ah, that's your slide. Right here. Yes, this shows you the canyon from about the midway point, looking down canyon, uh, Fajardo Butte in the uh, in the uh, uh, the major uh, topographical feature there. This is a picture of Sherry Lynn out on the point of what we call Chakra Mesa. The canyon is about 20 miles long. Uh, the park consists of about 16 miles of that. And you can see it's pretty austere. There's not much that grows there. And the climate has not changed all that much. We go through cycles and we're in a drought cycle now. They had wetter times, but not a whole lot. This is part of what I mean about there being, you know, my moon, right? This this kind of adventure. This chakra point here is higher than Fajada Butte, the signature geological, geographical feature of Chaco. The visitor center is over here. Mm -hmm. um, and the famous sun dagger that you'll hear about in the Mystery of Chaco video is actually, uh, what is it, Ranger? It's about right there. Right, right, right there, right mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. on top of Fajada Butte. Um, we won't emphasize that, but uh, uh, Anna Sofer's video does a very good job of documenting the phenomenon of that solar observing site. Pueblo Bonito is on Down Canyon here in Casa Rinconada. So this is just looking looking down uh, mm. the canyon. Most of what visitors can come to see uh, is on down the canyon. Back in this way. Yeah, this, this is the road, right? It mm -hmm. goes the loop. Right? Yep. It goes down in here. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Oops, Ranger. Yes, the picture, uh, I showed this picture not only because it has Sherry Lynn in it again, but also when you get up on top of the canyon, you can see forever. And this uh, allowed them to communicate with those far outlying regions. Oh. So you don't have much blocking your view when you get up on top. Yeah, this is a this is a big privilege. This is not a place that visitors normally normally venture to, and we got permission to to venture up there. And uh, given that I have not been on top of Fajada Butte yet, yes, <laughs> it's it's much more difficult than it used to be because the sun dagger no longer works since about 1989. Uh, it the the sands beneath it shifted, and uh, it no longer does what fortunately it was well documented to do in terms of recording the time the seasonal passages mm -hmm. with dramatic light on the rocks. Now this is the view up canyon, um, more near the um, uh, the core of Chaco, and this is Pueblo Bonito. You'll get a better view of it in a few moments. And this is the largest, most excavated of the buildings. Another building very large is just a few hundred yards over here. And the water flow is in this direction. And as you can see, the only thing really growing is in the wash, and these trees were planted in the 30s and the 40s. There was not a great forest here, but we'll say more about that in a few moments. And uh, Paul, you know, across Canyon here is where Casa Rinconada is. Yes. And yes. this uh, GB said, you know, there's another less excavated great house over here. And part of what I will be talking about, notice it's a very good view of it, I hadn't seen. This 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 uh, curvature in the canyon wall uh, here uh, is it, it may well be significant, and that's part of what my research is about this apparent quote empty space between the two largest greenhouses. This is uh, <clears throat> the picture on the front of our brochure, and is of course an artist's rendition of what the uh, largest of the buildings Pueblo Bonito may have looked like. Uh, it's only part of it. You'll see more in a few moments, but uh, this is what people come to see, and it's probably fairly accurate. Uh, the great houses on the canyon floor, like Bonito, are almost all on the, uh, the north side of the canyon, many of them, as Bonito, fairly close to the canyon. 
can the canyon wall. And, and you, uh, one of the things you don't see necessarily at first glance, these are the people, right? This is the size of this monumental. It covers over three acres right. and was certainly four stories high and maybe even higher. And are these earthen platforms in the front? What are these stages? I'm sorry. These are oh, yes. Square. The yeah. platforms I'll say more about in a few moments. They were a later introduction or a later addition to the building. And there are, there's a lot of questions about what they were for. The first archaeologists assumed they were the trash heaps, the middens, but uh, very little trash has been found on them. And deep down inside is some architecture, and I'll say more about that in a few moments. Mm. And I'm, I think, Judy, isn't it true that this, this pathway here goes straight over to Casa Rinconada? That's true. The largest great Cuba. So these may have been architectural features as well as uh, uh, something utilitarian. Mm -hmm. This is what people come to see now, and as you can see up here, uh, a lot of it has been crunched by a, uh, uh, a rockfall, uh, the largest rockfall that we know of in the canyon, certainly in historical times in 1941. Uh, so it impacted the building, but the building is still highly intact. It has not been restored as much as stabilized. So the excavation uncovered a lot of it. And uh, this is one of the uh, primary features that I'll also say something about in terms of the alignments in the buildings, these two walls. Uh, this wall is perfectly north-south, about as good as you could make it even today. And this is an east-west alignment. But if we go to one more here, you'll see that that east-west alignment disappears over here. Uh, a lot of speculation about what that's about. But we do see a very rigid alignment, set of alignments, north, south, east, and west. These come late in the building, and I'll say more about that in a few moments. Uh, yeah, I just want to inject uh, quickly that uh, GB and I were here, and Tony was here, and we were out doing uh, some Noman uh, explorations with the last equinox. And I think you heard Dr. Hall's um, uh, presentation, uh, how the, the Noman can be used to, and the equinox is the stones, the shadow of the stick in the ground turns out to be a straight line. And so we have photographs of that straight line of rocks, you know, that show the east west direction that, you know, that may be a very fundamental way that ancient people determined the cardinal directions and would have been a, would have been as delighted as we are when we see that that story. On, and layout. we did get Tony's uh, report on that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, let's see. It, which this largest room is that here? Um, it here. is just yeah, right about there. Right there. That's uh -huh. where you know uh, the we did the the a kinesthetic astronomy demonstration that I was holding the ball there, uh, and this then is this pathway into the petroglyph trail and the center place between the two largest great houses. Just starting to orient you uh, uh, a little bit to the situation. We watched an annual total solar eclipse on May 20th, 2012 from the Bonito uh, Plaza. Beautiful. This is the uh, overview that you can get to. It's uh, uh, one of the backcountry trails will take you so that you can see this view of the canyon, uh, uh, of the building. The next slide shows you what it looked like before excavation so that you get more of an idea. Uh, all of that place all the plazas and all that uh, that straight line uh, wall, uh, they're all covered. However, the back walls, the three, four story parts were very much in evidence. So this is just the beginning of the excavation in 1896 and it was excavated on through the twenties. So most of it was uncovered and then stabilized. Now, one little thing to note is this, you may be wondering yeah. about this. This is the field kitchen for the excavators yeah, that, you know, of course, would not be allowed uh, today. They moved right into the back of the building, and uh, you can see the smudge of the stove that they had on the outside of it. They camped there until they started building structures over here on this side of the building. Uh, and uh, the first excavator, starting in 1896, established a trading post as well as a ranch in the canyon. Huh. Now, this is the first stage of the building, as far as we know, 
And you can see the outline of what it became. So it's very small compared to what it became. And at this point in time, uh, there were three buildings in the canyon. Uh, and they're about equidistance from Bonito. One down canyon in this direction called Penasco Blanco and the other up canyon by the visitor center called Una Vida. There was one outlier to the south of the canyon, but for many years, this was the buildings. And as you can see, they were built during this period of time and then used. And it has kind of a soft alignment to the southeast. And that's a part of what changes that seems to be something significant about the canyon. Uh, when we go to the next picture, you'll see a schematic upside down, like it's uh, from that overlook again, showing you the same features. And then, as you can see, about 105 years later, they do something very significantly different. They now enclose the plaza. The building becomes much larger. The masonry is much more complex at this time. And many more buildings are started both in the canyon and outside the canyon. Hmm. Hmm. And this is a picture of that for those of you who like schematics uh, to kind of see how it works. I'm curious about you are here. How does that work? Well, I don't know. That, 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 I, I, I tried to get rid of that. I'm not sure what that means, so I didn't put it in. You may also notice that the, they've got north-south opposite. It, they, they, they rectify that in a few moments, but for a while it maintains this way. But this is north. Typical of non astronomers. There you go. There you go. All right. Ponderosa Pines. So, that earlier uh, artist's rendition where they showed a lone tree, that, that really was a tree there. Yeah, that has been debated hotly uh, over the years and especially lately. It may be that the, the tree was uh, brought in. Uh, it may be that it wasn't a growing tree. Uh, nobody knows for sure. There was a root ball of a large ponderosa pine that was discovered at that spot. Mm. That's as much as we can say about that. The next phase gets very significantly different and not very organized. There's a lot of mishmash here, but one of the things that happens at this point is we see the north-south line in this part of the structure. They still haven't quite got the east-west line as, uh, as clearly as they have the north-south line, but we start to see a rigid pattern of alignments to the cardinal directions. And the schematic really gives you a sense here of how it's organized it almost seems to be. Uh, a lot of people make note of these changes may be also relevant to the changes in the social organization. Most people think of Chaco as a hierarchy uh, we do not know this for sure. We do know that the current Pueblos and the historical Pueblos have certainly broken with that. But we start to see some of these rigid patterns uh, illustrated in the building. And then the next phase, a bigger mm -hmm. change yet. They've enclosed the plaza all right. And now it's much more organized here. We see the platforms for the first time. Uh, a few years back, they dug into the platforms as the first, uh, as a second excavator actually did back in the 20s, thinking these were trash mounds. The architecture deep down inside may be water flow that they were capturing from this area coming in here and then feeding it out into fields here. But eventually that was broken through by the wash. And so then they start building on top. To, uh, to what end, we're not quite sure. They were partially, if not completely, walled in, as you see here. They did have steps going up to them. They may have been presentation mounds and architectural mounds as well, enhancing the, the uh, uh, structure, uh, the entrance into the structure. But then we see this. Now, there's debate about whether this is, uh, these were actual walls uh, of part of the building, or if they're just foundations. But they did not utilize these for very long. You'll see in a moment how that changed again. But we also start to see landscaping or water control in different areas in the canyon, much more prominent. And here is the schematic of that. So what these are, we're not quite sure, but here's a picture taken from the 20s from the excavator who actually excavated that section. 
Over uh, here in the lower right, you see the curved uh, east side of Bonito. And then you see all of this structure and you see how massive it is by looking at these three people here. It's possible they were going to connect the two buildings, the building that's over here called Chetro Kettle. We're not sure what this is about, but they buried that. They put later structures up here called Hillside and you see more elaborate structures on the platforms. And uh, uh, what this was all about, we're not sure. When we see these kind of changes, people uh, um, speculate about social organization, political organization, perhaps different people having different designers in mind. We often say that these buildings were pre-planned and to a great extent that's true, but as you can see, they also went through some major changes. And then here's the schematic of that. And these are late buildings now. This is uh, up to 1250. These are um, uh, structures that were started as people were leaving Chaco. The final drought was just too much. They couldn't handle it and they had to leave and they became much more subsistent farmers, more independent. This is when you see Koyamonge also, the, uh, the outlier there. Uh, of Chaco, not an outlier of Chaco, but later additions uh, where people went from Bonito and, uh, and the canyon. We're pretty sure that the population of the canyon was diverse, speaking different languages as their descendants do today. And that's an important point of Chaco. And so what I wanted to really convey with all of this is that Chaco grew over time. When you talk about Chaco, you have to designate, well, what time are you talking about? That first part of the building that stood there for a hundred years before they started the monumental aspects of the building and started coalescing, um, bringing in uh, some of the outlying regions where they got a lot of the, uh, the resources, the trees, and there were 214,000 logs the size of telephone poles in some cases making up the roof beams in these buildings. They were almost all brought in from as far as 60, 70 miles away. So they were utilizing these outlying regions to get the resources that they did not have in the canyon. Mm -hmm. And then here's finally uh, what you see today when you go to Bonito, or at least not the photograph, but this is the, uh, the excavated structure. And it's only that half moon shape. All of the other that you saw out to the east side has not been excavated, uh, or if it was, it was filled back in. And uh, maintaining this and the other great houses is the, uh, uh, takes most of the resources of the park service so that people can come and actually walk through the building. And I thought you'd like to see this as the end of this part of the uh, presentation. Uh, this is behind uh, Casa Rinconada and is one of my favorite of the uh, what the researchers call anthropomorphs. And uh, it's it's quite deeply cut and uh, it's quite beautiful. Wow. Yeah. I have a confession to make, um, and that is that I forgot to put my center place slides in. I think this is a great time to pause for conversation and questions about this segment yeah and we get we get we stop sharing and i get the, those those slides together and but meanwhile there could be a little micro q a in here does that make sense uh paul sure. or, yeah, yeah. 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 you know about about the bonito and there might be a number of questions so you you carry on please and i will well, Lord, yes. please, <laughs> any questions that you have i would love to hear yeah, and and in, by the way, just a little bit of technology uh, explanation on the participant. If you click on participants list over to the far right side of the very bottom of the list is a button that says raise hand. So if you want to ask a question, uh, raise hand electronically because it's hard for me to be able to scan the, uh, the gallery view and find hands, but uh, so we can do both. We can do gallery We already view. have a raised hand from Dave and Linnea. No, they, they, were, they raised their hand to say that they had been there, but I don't oh, know, maybe, I maybe, see. maybe Dave right. and Linnea would like to uh, make yeah. a comment, but. Uh, well, while we're waiting for some somebody to uh, come forward with a question or two, the last petroglyph that you showed, what was that? It wasn't quite a petroglyph. It was more uh, elaborately a relief, carved. A relief. Um, well, it, it, it is. 
It is a petroglyph because it's carved into the uh, cliff rather deeply. Yeah, deep. And uh, there was a structure or a series of structures up behind Casa Rinconada in a rincon that's uh, off limits to the public. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of rock art up there. And uh, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's a significant. Uh, I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> <laughs> you shared several of those with us earlier. Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah. So, some may oh not gosh. know the reference, but uh, we, on our advanced group, we did a posture, an exploratory posture with the hands and the arms in, a in, that, very, position. in that, that position that was shown in that artifact. And we showed examples of it from around the world. It was unbelievable how many places in the world have this particular petroglyph. And, and, and so we did that posture with tremendous and It, it fun was very results. cosmic uh, experiences. Let right. me just put it that way. Yeah. I'm going to share those notes with you. We'll do that quite, another quite time. quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it looks oh, like. Just we, I didn't, I just put my hand up um, electronically just to say that we had been to Chaco Canyon, I didn't really have a question. But okay. somebody else posted a question asking how big was that carving that we saw at the end of the presentation? It was, it's about a foot and a half high. It's, a, it's one of the larger ones and uh, more deeply cut than many others. Yeah. But it, it follows the pattern that we see, uh, as you say, all over the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember once uh, taking a group of people out to some of the rock art and there was a, a similar petroglyph and uh, one of the uh, participants, one of the visitors, was from South Africa and he took out of his pocket a fetish that he always had on him that was carved out of ivory that was almost exactly that same, that same form. Mm -hmm. So it is a uh, ubiquitous form worldwide. Um, Sherilyn, I know you bit, you've done a bit of research on that canyon wall between Chetro Kessel and uh, the Benito. Could you, are you going to address that later or do you want to speak to that now? Some yes, and that's that. exactly what I'm uh, trying to uh, get, get ready for you that I got the 514, I got the uh, eclipse petroglyph in there, but I did not do an adequate job of getting you some lovely visuals uh, regarding that portion. So I'm going to do that forthwith. I'm just about there. Yeah. Okay, and uh, that will do it, I think. Uh, let's yeah. see. You can now see people's hands raised because uh, we see a screenshot of everybody if you've been yeah, we, to We have the Chaco opportunity Canyon. to see the... Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also raise your hand if you have a question. Um, um, no, okay, Judith, you have a question? Yeah, can you can you unmute yourself? Um, I think I did. Oh, there you are. Yep. Yep, we hear you. I've been there many times, but I'm an artist and I do art about Chaco Canyon, so I just wanted to hold it oh, for, look hold at it for that. a minute because oh, I there's no one no one else is seeing it. One second, I have to. I have uh, GB and uh, Sherilyn locked, so now we'll go to your picture. Let's see if that shows up. Now go ahead and speak again and hold up your. I'm a fiber artist and I have been to Chaco many times and I have done art about Chaco. And this is one of the earlier. Uh, is that fabric? That's fabric, like a quilt, right? That's fabric. It's painted on silk and quilted. Wow. Oh, wow. Fabulous. How beautiful. It has turquoise and other stones sewn on it. So that yeah. was one of the earlier phases. Awesome. And then of the later phases. Yep. Oh, wow. Beautiful. That is gorgeous. Look at that. I just wanted yeah. to see uh -huh. it. So. Thank you. Yeah. We've met. You're in Placitas. Yeah. 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 I'm it's good to see you again. Yeah. 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 Great. So. Any, any Who's in Placitas? Of... Judith Roderick is in Placitas. We go there all the time. Okay. Yeah. I met you at a party at Bobby's. Right. At Bobby and John's. Okay. Yeah. 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 Dear, oh, dear friends. Dear friends, okay. okay. So I, I'm I'm ready at last. When you're ready, you all. Well, sure. I have one more question from Linda. Yeah. Has her hand up, Linda Grace? Would you like to ask? Very good. Well, uh, just in an appropriate time, I'd like to hear more about the dark sky designation. Mm. Good question. I can definitely talk to that. In 2013, we were designated an international dark sky park 
in terms of the national parks in the United States, we were number four. There have been several since. The International Dark Sky Association is situated in Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, they travel all over the world, obviously, international, and uh, find places not only that have dark skies, but introduce people to the dark skies. And uh, in order to get that designation, we had to be nominated and uh, the uh, Albuquerque Astronomical Society nominated us. And then we had to go through several procedures to make sure our lighting fit the criteria. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, blazing forth. We used to have the visitor center lit up all night long, um, but now it's on motion sensors. The observatory that was uh, uh, put in Chaco in 1998 is the only working observatory in a national park that allows visitors to look at the dark sky. And Chaco, there's, there's been some mitigation of the darkness of the sky in that light pollution and the fracking and all of that, but it is still one of the best night skies in the country. And so our night sky program has been one of the more popular ones of our interpretive programs in the canyon. And with the uh, advent of the uh, observatory, it uh, drew the attention of the International Dark Sky Association. And so we're quite proud of that. And we want to keep the dark sky. And uh, so far, uh, it, still, it still remains one of the best. You were instrumental in getting that observatory going and getting this program, weren't you, GB? That was I have to say, uh, letting go of some, uh, you know, maybe a little immodest, I began the night sky program in Chaco when I was campground host in, uh, in uh, 1988. And, um, uh, and it With a was, personal telescope was, at camping in the campground. That's right. <laughs> it was my telescope, little eight inch telescope that I had. And every night I had a star party. And then I began doing talks on the study of archaeoastronomy, the ancient people's astronomy, which has been uh, going on since the late 60s. Mm. And it turns out that most of the research proposals put into Chaco are somehow regarding the astronomy of the ancient people. You know, we forget because we don't often have the treat of the dark, dark, dark sky, how many stars there are when you are under a dark sky. And so not only during the day do you have these extraordinary buildings to wander through and you, you are at the campground at night. That's the best place to stay is that little campground. It's so cozy and beautiful. And you look up at night and there are the stars and you start to understand. It's a big piece of understanding the whole magic of it. It's, there's so many stars. They're so brilliant. It's how could you not um, celebrate that sky? It's Can't been be said in the last few years that uh, most people on the planet now live where they cannot see the Milky Way. Yeah, much much more than most. It's it's over seventy percent is the, the uh, an estimate of a few years ago. Mm. You come to Chaco, and when it's up, you see the Milky Way. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, mm. it's breathtaking. Yeah, yeah. I mean so, that's part. No of wonder the they were celebrating the skies. Part of visiting Chaco is that experience of camping and staying there. You can't go there for one day. It's not a one day event. No, please don't. <laughs> it's not a, it's, yeah. Well, a couple nights and a half. Yes. Well, yeah, so don't miss the one day, but still, yeah. it's so frustrating. What, you yeah. know, I think GB uses a, a, a term in his tours. He says, you know, uh, what, what is, you ask people who's been to Chaco before, right? Yeah. And then you say, sort of, if, okay, if you don't come back, then there's... There's something wrong with you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, even just hiking between two buildings and the crunch of the rocks and, and just feeling the, the landscape is also so significant. Because you wonder why there? What drew them to that remote canyon that wasn't really that supportive of uh, uh, That's a great lead-in question, uh, uh, Laura. That's well, a beautiful we'll lead-in. Good. Yeah. Uh, but I want to also acknowledge Sorcha's uh, comment. She know she sees the Milky Way from where she lives, and she knows what she's got, and and that's a little bit of a challenge in Four Corners country, 
people have access to the Milky Way, but they don't really understand it. Most people don't. They don't understand the gift that it is. And so, you know, we get the unshielded lights and so on. So it, it, uh, good, Sartre. Thank you for putting up that you, that you appreciate uh, what you've got. Awesome. May I share the screen? Yes, uh, yeah, go back. yes. Mm -hmm. great. Because it, yeah, it plays. Uh, this is a a, a a guided walk that I don't expect anybody to read that um, that I created. You see, Bonito is over here on the left, and Chetro Kettle over here on the right. So far as we know, the two largest great houses in that vast Jacobin system that you uh, that we uh, talked about, and this is may well be the center of the center place. Here's a, a, a Lindbergh, Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh. Um, uh, my daddy says I was named in part for Anne Morrow Lindbergh because I'm Sherilyn Anne Morrow. Um, here is their 1929 aerial photograph of this region between Pueblo Benito and you see the less excavated Chetro Kettle uh, covering a comparable area here. This curved part of the canyon wall, I started getting very fascinated by this place in between the two largest great houses. You know, when visitors come, there's a tendency, right, to run to the thing. But I got very interested in what about the space between mm -hmm. the things? Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, you know, so, uh, that curve in the wall turns out to be fairly significant uh, feature. So let's see if I can make this thing. There we go. There is, uh, just for fun, uh, I wonder who replying and who is taking the picture. Either one, either one would be a pretty adventurous thing. And they were commissioned as part of their honeymoon to fly over the American Southwest and make aerial photographs, the first aerial photographs of archaeological sites uh, in New Mexico, Arizona, predominantly. Yeah, what a great there's, record to have. Yeah, yeah that's a, there's a book about that now where a modern flyer. Uh, has made the same photographs and put them side by side in a in a book. So, so here again to orient you, this is Pueblo Bonito, which uh, GB told us about. This is the fall of Threatening Rock uh, uh, in 1941. Here is a different view of Chetro Kettle. So this is a more modern uh, aerial high sea photograph. This is the the guy who flies in his ultralight and makes and, and made the Lindbergh photos, remade them. So researchers have called this area here an amphitheater uh, because uh, they basically were working out here. You saw GB showed you these pictures with all of this architecture, you know, underground that was excavated in the latter stages um, uh, out to the uh, east of Pueblo Benito. Um, they were out working in this field and they started hearing their voices amplified at unreasonable distances, hmm. right? And so they were going, well, what, what, how come I can hear you way over there? You know, it was like uh, being in a, in a dome structure, right? And you know, where somebody's whispering over here and you hear what they say over here. So they got very curious about the acoustics of this area. Um, and they brought a bunch of equipment out and they wrote a report, the fellow's name is Richard Luce. And this was one of the many reports I've since read in my archival uh, research of this area in between the two largest great houses. And so not only is it possible uh, to hear special echoes, I found out by looking at the research report, this is the modern day parking lot that you go into to walk to Bonito or to walk over to Chatro Kettle. Um, I found out that if I took visitors, I can't take them into the hot spots here, but if I took them out to the edge of the parking lot, they could experience a rather phenomenal uh, echo, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I, I will demonstrate as I am want to do uh, eventually. Oh, interesting. Well, there's a little bit of a sideways picture of Ariel Heisey and his ultralight. So here's a, a cartoon that I made of this area where again, Pueblo Bonito is here on the left, Chetro Kettle on the right the amphitheater or the Navajo name for it, something of that nature, which translated means curved rock that speaks. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and it is there. And one of the lessons of the guided walk I do out there is that 
when we translate between indigenous languages that are very verb and relationship oriented and English, which is uh, an English language is very noun specific. So we call it amphitheater, but the Navajo language gives it curved rock that speaks. It says something about what it does when you interact with it. So at the end of the parking lot that I showed you in the last photograph, if you know, there's a special echo. And when I, when I, you know, we think of echo, we think of la, 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 you know, something like this. No, no, no. If I say hello to this, from the parking lot into this curved area, hello, it will do the following. Ready? Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, how are you? How are you? With extraordinary fidelity and a conversational like gap in between, right? So uh -huh. it's, it's, you say, how are you? How are you? And then when I get a group of people to all call into the, to this curved place in the rock, um, they basically, uh, it, you say one, two, three, Chaco, and every, you know, 12 voices say Chaco. You can hear each individual voice as well as the collective voice, right? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yes, Laura, it's, 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 a, it's a marvelous phenomenon and it just surprises and delights. And so I make this multi-sensory, most people are not trying their voices out on the canyon wall, but look, um, this is the east, oops, uh, this is the east-west, I need to be here, there we go, this east-west line between the two largest great houses. Here also are two other great houses along a north-south line, unseen to you when you stand here. A great house atop the south um, mesa and a great house, Pueblo Alto, atop the north mesa. This is a crossroads. Oh my of great houses here in this quote, empty space in between, right? So there are these intersite alignments, north, south, east, west, and there is this acoustic phenomenon that is gets even better. Here's Casa Rinconada over here, where Paul had his epiphany. Nearby is a constructed mound. If archeologists do transects, no charcoal, no bones, no architecture, no pot shards, it was a mound. These people knew how to move earth, right? Uh, they not only moved logs, as GB said, but they moved earth and rock. No horse, no birds, beasts of burden, earth of burden, no, no, <laughs> no beasts of burden, no metal, stone tools, right? But hauling uh, a lot of earth. Okay, so here we have this intersite alignment. We have this acoustic phenomenon, we, this constructed mound, the acoustic researchers who came in here after hearing voices, went over here and found out that if you cast sound, musical or collective voice in this direction, the people in here can hear it from across the canyon. <laughs> okay, so there's, the, mm -hmm. and vice versa, there are certain places you can stand in here and cast sound into here and it can be heard over here. Not specific words and voices, but certainly, you know, vocalizations. You can definitely come across, right? Across the canyon. Mm -hmm. And so you say, well, so what? It's kind of cool. There are lots of curved places in the canyon, you know, where you might get cool echoes and so on. Um, uh, this, is, this interested me because of its location between the two largest great houses. GB and I went on a tour of uh, Acoma Pueblo, Sky City, which is 40 miles uh, west of Albuquerque, and one of the oldest and most connected affiliates, uh, uh, their ancestors make connections to Chaco Canyon. So Acoma Pueblo, another place to put on your visit list uh, if you come into the region. We were listening to the tour guide who said, in the beginning, our people, you know, walked the canyon uh, you know, and cried out uh, to the canyon wall a sacred word, haku, haku, and how the canyon wall responded told us where to put our home. <laughs> so we have not only alignments between the buildings and alignments to celestial sun, moon, uh, celestial moments of, of the sun cycle, we have alignments to a magical acoustical place. Yes. So does this denote here, let's set up ceremony, let's, 
let's work with the earth and these mysterious properties. These are significant. Let's hallmark them. Let's create a, a ritual stage for them. Let's incorporate this in our ceremonies. What do you think is going on here? You know, I think your intuition is, is right on, and so do those researchers. You know, GB spoke of, you know, people coming in from all directions, right? I mean, there are major roads that come in here to the Mesa, and then there are places where you can come down into the canyon all along here. Um, uh, I could easily imagine, look, these are going to be four, as, as you said, Laura, four and five-story structures. They'll be plastered on the outside. The monumental architecture would have been awesome, right? With, you know, in the era of their fluorescence here, right? And so they're not disguised in the ground, you know, in the era where people would be coming in, what, perhaps on pilgrimage? Um, you could imagine this as a gathering place, right? A huge gathering wonderful. place for a lot of people. For a lot of people. So everybody who came in could position themselves here next to these mar marvelous places, experience. Also, it turns out that the researchers found if you cast voice from over here to over here, the experience in here is not that the voice came from the constructed mound. The experience is that it's a disembodied voice. Mm -hmm. right? That it co Where is that coming from? The spirit uh, is speaking. Also, there is a cavity in the wall here that goes back 12 feet into the North Canyon wall, and there could be room for four people to have emerged ceremonially from the rock. We know that in Kivas, there can be a kind of almost theatrical emergence, right, from the underground of the Kiva. So mm -hmm. a theatrical type emergence from... So here we are, this is, we can, we get to conjecture here, right? I mean, no one knows this for sure, of course, but it gets even better from an astronomer's point of view. Um, I, I also want to point out, you know, this alignment, there is another north-south alignment between a satellite building to the big great house, Pueblo Alto, New Alto, one of my favorite places to go in the canyon. You can hike up there. And it comes through the hillside ruin and, and is directly north-south from Casa Rinconada and have a picture of how you can see these walls aligned. So here, this center place, um, so much going on. These are just a few aerial photographs quickly. You see, uh, these are real photographs, Chetro Kettle here on the right, Pueblo Bonito and Tusin Glatzen, and then Pueblo Alto, uh, you can see uh, uh, the the whole look. Here's Sinclair in the little nub here. You see the great topography of the canyon. Here is, you see the vague outline of Pueblo Alto here. And you can, you can believe it. It's for real. It's not just a cartoon. And here's the connection uh, between Chapu Kettle and Pueblo Alto. And here's the artificial mound over near Casa Rinconada. Okay, uh, let's go on. There's that cavity I spoke of hmm. in the center place. And they found effigy heads, right, which we can't uh, show you, uh, but, uh, you know, effigy heads uh, of wood, made of wood and other materials uh, that were um, taken out of there in the 1930s. A cool, th there's petroglyphs all along the wall, all along the wall between the two largest great houses. Oh this is an interesting, particularly interesting petroglyph. You can describe it as of 18 inches long with one, two, three, four, five, you know, lobes on either side, five or six and two diagonal lines. Or you can interpret it. What does it look like to you? And we make a point of distinguishing between interpreting something and, and describing something. So we can describe it in geometric elemental terms or we can interpret it. And you all, you could write in the chat box, what, what do you think that looks like? What do you think that looks like? Uh, it's not an anthropomorph, obviously, right? Or a human-like figure. What does it look like to you? And this is the kind of inquiry we offer, you know, to, to visitors. What does that look like to you? And so um, before we offer anything more, I just give you just, just a few seconds to type something in to, to the chat box and see what is that? What is that? Just it's always it data right. gathering. There's yeah. no right or wrong answer. It's, it's just a little bit of interactivity with you uh, to, to sort of, what is that? What does that look like? Wow. And this is on, again, on this wall, which is loaded with rock art of different types all along between the two great houses, Chetro Keto and Pueblo Benito, where this amphitheater is, where this Sabina Hosayalfe, this curved rock that speaks is. 
Yeah. Some of the so here's how you switch topics. Um, so the pageantry, the symbology, the choreography, the setting up of the the landscape is part of the record that you can read with the buildings and their relationships and and uh, all of this and the ceremonies that might have taken place. When you go to the descendants today and you say, what does this mean? Do you have similar cosmological setups? Do you have relationship? You mentioned Akama, which is still occupied. What do the descendants of these people say today about this? Um, do they lend some insight into that? You know, I had one opportunity, GGP can maybe address this, but I had one opportunity to show a singer from one of the modern day pueblos, the phenomenon that I am describing to you that I hope you will all find a way to experience uh, acoustically. And all he did is smile and nod his head. <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't speak about it, but he, he was completely unshocked or, un, you know, there was not a big outward response as there is from my poor participants, but there was a recognition. I would, I would interpret his response as a, aha, uh -huh, yes, of course. Yeah. Among the Pueblos today, we hear many different opinions about what Chaco was all about. They all agree it was a center gathering place. And then the details, uh, sometimes they're not so open to talking about it. Uh, sometimes you have the feeling they know a lot more than they say. And, but sometimes they also will express um, their own um, inability to really understand it. Uh, what we see after Chaco, to a certain extent, is a reaction against Chaco, the large monumental rigidly aligned buildings are no longer a part of their culture in quite that way. Mm -hmm. But they have learned many of the lessons uh, of how to survive in this environment from their time in Chaco. So they have many different opinions. And when we look at their practices today, we see some reflections of some of the things that we believe we're seeing in Chaco. But then we see things that are very, very different also. So it adds to the confusion a bit. And without a written language, we're left with a lot of speculation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So both of you have been especially observant of this panel may have noticed these birds over here on the left. There's a lot going on on this panel. I don't know what people have written there, um, uh, but uh, you wanna... here's a couple a couple of responses. Uh, Carolyn a Snake, uh, Naomi. There's a spiral column, a caterpillar. Uh, coming down the list, we've got Melissa saying centipede, Nancy saying mm -hmm. spinal column, caterpillar, spine, uh, Karen Dancer, uh, Pat's a backbone, uh, Sorsha, a sky representation. That's an interesting one. And then F Fred Fred Smith asked a good question. He says, this is, a, this is similar to a foundation. I'm sorry, my mouth is going to get woken up here. <laughs> uh, this is similar to a formation at the effigy mounds in Northeast Iowa on bluffs overlooking the Mississippi. The FC Mounds uh, formation have six or seven circles as well, flat out on the ground. It looks to me like six or seven chakras, but that might be reading too much into it. Anyway, so we'll get Fred to speak later and ask his own questions, but I thought that Fred, was Fred's joining us next Sunday. Yeah, Fred will be Hey, hello, Fred. Great, great to have you on the board. Wonderful. So no, this is wonderful. What a great collection. So we got some new ones. Each time I ask this of a group of visitors, I get some same ones and we get different ones, right? And so it's a lovely inquiry and we make that distinction again between describing a piece of rock art, which Jane Colbert, the rock art specialist who's documented so much of the rock art in the canyon, uh, she basically really is, makes that distinction, you know, so when we, we observe it to describe and interpret it because we don't really know, here's one, radical interpretation that, that a person in our latitude wouldn't think of, the arrangement of cacao pods and plants, uh, given the possibility, the real possibility of a Mesoamerican connection with the Chaco phenomenon. So either the pods, as they appear on the, the plant itself, or cutting the pods open, you see an arrangement of cacao seeds. Well, why cacao? Well, there was this excavation of cylindrical pot from Pueblo Benito. I believe, GB, this is room 33, is that correct? Uh, room 28. Room 28, thank you. Okay, 33 has other significance. 
cylindrical pots, um, a, a modern day archaeologist from the University of New Mexico, Patricia Crown, wanted to know what's going on with the cylindrical pots. They are an art form coming from Mesoamerica. And they said, the, the ancestors said, you know, we drink a cacao drink out of these cylindrical pots. So she set out to, to see if they could find the residue of cacao, the chemical signature using modern day mass spectroscopy of cacao. Now hard enough to find a pot that was taken out of the ground and not touched or cleaned or something, but she was able to find, uh, you know, pot shards that were wrapped up and kept uh, and was able to find in fact mm -hmm. the residue of cacao in, in uh, cylindrical pots. So the choco chocolate uh, connection with Mesoamerica is 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 real. Here's another petroglyph, my favorite in the park, um, and I won't go through the exercise, but you can do it for yourself. You know, in terms of what you see there. Um, one of the and please go ahead to put it in the chat. I'll just say a few things. We won't spend as long, but um, most folks, of course, see something uh, that is. Uh, 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 bird-like. My favorite uh, uh, piece of rock art, because Jane Colbert tells us that of all of the rock art techniques, uh, 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 pecked, pecked, thank you, pecked, abraded, incised, and drilled. I have a yeah. mnemonic called paid. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> pecked, abraded, incised, and drilled as a framework that she uses for describing rock art. This particular piece of rock art well, I don't know, it's, it's bigger than your hand outstretched, um, it is, uh, has all of those techniques associated with it. Um, and, yeah, so it's a really special piece. And I, I put it on the guided walk out there because people normally don't see it. Even with signage, it's, it's a little bit higher up and don't see it. So I'm curious what people put, but one interpretation of this, uh, aside from a roadrunner with a snake in its mouth, uh, might be a parrot. And I've had indigenous people on my walks say, you know, oh, parrot clan or something of that nature. And the parrot connection, uh, there have been feathers and bones of macaw parrots from, uh, from deeper in the south, from Mesoamerica, found in Pueblo Benito. It's clear they had the live bird there. So somebody brought those up. They didn't live for very long, but it shows a direct connection with Mesoamerica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there is, you know, a, a picture of a macaw, uh, very colorful bird, a very, um, a very beautiful bird, and the feathers and bones were just there. So let's see. Uh, in this area, this is this is what the the uh, threatening rock looked like before it fell on Bonito. So this we know is prior to 1941. This we call Child of Threatening Rock, and it still stands. On the petroglyph trail, very near where those petroglyphs I just showed you are, from this place here, the center place is just about to get better. <laughs> that is the sunset that I witnessed a few years ago on the winter solstice. Okay, so sunset, very lovely horizon feature for the winter solstice. So not only the center place have an acoustic feature, intrasite alignments between major great houses, rock art out the wazoo, incredible acoustics, and horizons to the sunrise and sunset at the winter solstice time. Oh my. Right? And adding, you know, and this being a very significant time of year. And so adding to the, to, to the drama, uh, that was really the phenomena. I saw this first through a filter when I was out on an archaeoastronomy team with uh, Dr. Andy Monroe uh, and uh, was running around looking for an alignment in what I knew to be a culturally uh, rich place. And this is a photograph that GB and I went out and made subsequent uh, to that find and have enjoyed that. Now there's a sunset program for the public that you can go out there on the winter solstice to, to see that with your own eyes uh, through a filter. So uh, it just, it, this is the magic that caused me to get fascinated by this apparently empty space that really is, I hope persuaded you that it's not at all empty. And when I end this program at the um, overlook for Bonito and looking over the plaza, I say, oh, look at that empty plaza down there. Meaningless, right? 
<laughs> ah, yeah, right. <laughs> they will send you a ceremony for a great house. No, no, the empty space. And as a physicist, I invoke the modern physical idea. You know, modern physics tells us that, okay, we're made up of atoms and that atoms are mostly empty space, right? And so why is it when we touch each other and I invite the visitors to touch each other or a nearby wall, we touch each other, touch something, you feel we have the experience of solidity, right? Why doesn't our hand pass through something that's mostly empty space made up of atoms? Actually, it's about the interaction and the interactivity, the electromagnetic forces in the empty space between the thingness of the atomic nuclei. So there's this importance of the empty space, which is alive with energy and field. It's alive with interaction and interconnectivity and relationship. So modern physics pulls us, modern physics pulls us to understand that relationship is as important as thingness. And the, the, the message of Chaco, in my view, one of its interpretations is that the relationship, the way the things are laid out, the way the horizon and meets the sky, the way the buildings are laid out, the way things are chosen for where to put them, and the interaction with the canyon wall that you have, the interactivity and the relationship and the alignments are just as important as the thingness. And so this walk in this apparent empty space, this valuing of empty space and relationship and interconnectivity is the big idea of this space in between. And it may well be this space in between the two largest great houses is the center of the center place that Chaco Culture National Historical Park is, is, is representing and preserving. Oh, let's see. I, that's a, over. Uh, that is the uh, a look, an aerial look at Rinconada. And I won't. I will spare you the sunrise lesson. Um, uh, <laughs> but I, if if you could take a moment to be like a, a sun watcher, uh, be like a sun watcher, and given this information that you see from Casa Rinconada of where the solstice sunrise, that picture of GB that we saw in the beginning, right? And he spoke of the magic of being there to witness sunrises which you too can be standing where this picture is made from. Uh, given that this, the, the solstice sunrise is here on the horizon at the base of this, uh, at the bottom of that horizon feature, the equinox sunrise is here due east, due west. And the winter solstice sunrise down here at the, uh, uh, the, the, the southernmost sunrise, right? That we get during the course of the year. The, the low trajectory of the sun, if you go back just a second, here's the winter, right, trajectory, very low, not very much time in the sky. Here is the equinox trajectory, and here is the summer trajectory with that sunrise, yeah? And so you see not very much time to uh, heat the ground. Uh, this is a winter, low trajectory, not very many daylight hours. Okay, but notice how the sunrise changes position on the horizon. Right, and so that's what this is showing you. Now I would ask you to see if you're grokking this, where would the sunrise on your birthday? <laughs> on this horizon. And once you can master that question, then you know about use of a horizon calendar as these people almost certainly did. They really were intimately familiar with where the sun is rising from significant places in the canyon. And there's all kinds of evidence uh, for that knowledge of sun watching. So uh, let's see, anyone have a January birthday out there? So. I do. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. So Ranger GB has a January birthday. Let me yeah. ask everyone, where would the January, where would the January sun rise? So just thinking about it, not in terms of specific of December. December. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of my very intelligent visitors uh, will say out here mm -mm. in that kind of natural left to right, you know, uh, modality, right? But of course, what the sunrise appears to do is to cycle back and forth. Yeah. Like a pendulum. Like a pendulum, exactly, because what's happening, of course, is the Earth is, is axis is tilted and it's orbiting around the sun. But that's not what these folks knew, but they knew, oh, that's as far south. GB, you have a beautiful story to tell about the ceremony that would occur in the, in the summer, or sorry, in the winter solstice, right? Yeah, 
Many of the stories that the people tell us have variations from the different tribes, but uh, one is that the son goes into his winter house because for four or five days, the sun will rise in the solstice position, so they don't seem to change. Right. Uh, and during that time, uh, the son is asking questions about us, the children. Are they of good heart? Have they walked well upon their mother, the earth? Are they worthy of life? And if the answer is no, that fourth or fifth day, the sun just keeps going south out of the sky and everything dies. Nothing survives that. So it is very important to be able to predict that moment when the sun goes into his winter house well beforehand, maybe a couple of weeks, and then the ceremonies can unfold properly. And the ceremonies are a way of invoking the order of the universe down onto the earth. And so if the people are walking well, if the ceremonies are done properly, they will be seen to be of good heart. And that brings the father of the son back into the sky northward for another yearly cycle. So then we, we go January, as Laura uh, said, January about here, February, see, Jesse, January, February, March, April, May, June, June, July, right? So May and July in a similar place, right? Uh, August, September. So each of these places in between here have kind of two months in, the, in that area where the sun will rise. So hopefully you've identified your birthday mm -hmm. on uh, this horizon. And now- The way the sun's going, yeah. That's, yeah, and the which way the sun is, the sunrise position will appear to move given what time of year that you're in. So, so they say that they don't have a written language, but actually the landscape uh, is the calendar and a timepiece. The buildings, if you know how to decode them, are telling you about their cosmology and about their worldview. I mean, it's it's written. It's just not in a written language, but it's writ out if you know how to decode it as you're doing. It says, that's you find that the memory of those times of the year are embedded in the landscape and the architecture. Yep. Once those rhythms are understood, and they were probably understood long before the great houses were ever constructed, yeah. Because people lived in the canyon for thousands of years before they started building these monumental structures. They had to understand these patterns uh, of the natural world so that when they did construct the great houses, they could put them in places and put features in them that would be the, uh, the calendars, the timekeeping. Right. So um, I would also assume that they had mythologies and stories and cultural uh, identity all tied up in that as well. But we're and just, we're just and we know that they still do, of course, and uh, which ones have survived and are the same stories as a thousand years ago, we can only guess at. But there's no question that their knowledge of all of this, in part, comes out of their experience in Chaco, because it's embedded now. You can go a thousand years later to certain spots and see what they saw. Right. Right, it's eternal. It's a good, it's a good place to park your cultural identity. It's unchanging. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is just there's the Rinconada. We were looking at the horizon from over here on the west side and looking east across the Kiva, and here you see the north-south alignment with New Alto on the top. There's no signage to tell you about that. It's something to look for. So put it on your list when you go the next time to Chaco or for the first time. This is the fall of Threatening Rock Bonito. This is the corner of Bonito over here. And this is a precious place to go uh, on the out the country back country trail to see this smaller great house. So that's one of the north south lines in the center of the center place. Just that cartoon this line here to reprise it from Casa Rinconada to New Alto. So I hope that we have persuaded you that this area, which seems to have nothing in it when you arrive in the parking lot, is extremely culturally full and the imagination soars in regards to what sort of gathering place the center of the center place might have been. Hmm. Okay, that's a good place to pause and check in. What, what we have uh, here is just a uh, a, this place called um, uh, 
Chaco 29 SJ514. It's a sun watching place that's in sight of Fajada Butte that where the sunrise occurs. Oh, look at that. Uh, so this is GB's documentation uh, for the for archaeoastronomers. And this is what the punch, uh, the NASA punch mission that's observing the solar corona is getting all excited about. We're going to make a planetarium show that features uh, this sunrise among many other of archaeoastronomical features, but I just love it's about a half a moon, a half a month before uh, the summer solstice, uh, this sun's disk rolls up the side of this rock, right? This pyramid shaped rock. And it's just very, uh, very fun and beautiful. And it's from the right side of this rock complex, which is very near the visitor center. Here's the pyramid rock. Hmm. And uh, the eclipse petroglyph is on this panel, uh, then I'll show you a close up. And then GB, I think, has some rock arts to finish this off. Um, I'm not pausing, I'm sorry, let's just go on through it. Um, in this, this complex is a focus of, uh, of our uh, outreach effort associated with Punch, where we're going to do ancient and modern sun watching theme. And that's the view of Fajada from there. There's a, a contextual shot, a panorama that uh, TB made of the, you see on the left, the Pyramid Rock, and on the right, uh, the Fajada Butte. Uh, let's go to the petroglyph. Uh, no, there's GB to give you a scale. He's uh, making a photograph in front of a spiral, looking out toward the pyramid shaped rock whose shadow that you see right there. That's the view from the spiral of the pyramid. There's, there you see how close it is to the visitor center, but it is off limits to visitors unfortunately without a guide, but it, this is very steep and not safe. There's Jane Colbert's drawing. This foot is not at all obvious. I've never seen it, even though I've stared right at the spiral. Mm -hmm. And there are some more of these uh, anthropomorphs in this, uh, in a similar posture. Uh, there is the center of the spiral. It's very hard to photograph in that line that extends up and the shadow interacting with the spiral, albeit in a fuzzy manner. Um, so this is now what it looks like. And we, with a guide, you can walk up here and look at this panel. The spiral is around this corner, but this petroglyph, this is the panel when you're standing on that walkway. Um, and you see most people will recognize a flute player. And you have some of these fellows, mm -hmm. uh, these fellows again on this same panel, along with this very distinctive. And we could ask you, also, again, you can describe it and people, you can interpret it. What does it look like to you, your interpretation of that? <laughs> well, yeah, and people say a lot of things. I'm sure you all have in mind things like octopus, your Hopi man, you looked at it with UGB, right? And said- He said it was a tick. <laughs> now he laughed. I don't know if he actually believed that, but that was his first thought, and it took me months to get that out of my mind. <laughs> the sacred <A> beetle. <laughs> so it's about yeah. the, the disc is about four inches wide, and the, it's very finely pecked. It's very beautiful. Um, and it's very unique. And very unique. And a solar physicist happened to be uh, walking by it during a field school. Uh, here's a little bit of a closer up. It's very nicely pecked, right? and decided that perhaps because the Chacoans would have witnessed not only that supernova GB described in the beginning in 1054, but also a total solar eclipse in 1097, which mm -hmm. is when Bonito would have been on pretty well built from that construction that he showed us earlier on. 1097, a total solar eclipse, independent analysis have shown that a maximum in the sun's 11 year cycle of activity, right? Mm -hmm. would have occurred in 1098. Did the Chacoans see a twisted up solar corona wow. during the 1097 eclipse and maybe even with Venus, this pecking of this, you know, the bright star Venus, which you would see. In 1024, you have an opportunity in the United States to see a total solar eclipse at a time of high solar activity. Right, 1024 is, is peak of solar activity. You too might see the solar corona entangled like this. The feature is not straight streamers, but perhaps a solar storm popping off during the time that you are witnessing those few minutes 
uh, of totality. So that is a focal point for the ancient and modern sun watching theme that we're pursuing uh, th that involves Chaco Canyon. And this is the, a better picture of the spiral uh, that you're standing in front of to see that dramatic sunrise. And these are, you know, closer up pictures of these anthropomorphs. There's a hand drawing of a active solar corona during a time of solar eclipse. This is 1860. Mm. And so white Western astronomy says this is the first recording of a solar storm in the solar atmosphere. We are going to say maybe there was somebody way ahead of them. Way ahead. Right, way ahead in 1097. Perhaps this is the first of humanity's known depictions of an active stormy solar corona during a total solar eclipse, that faint outermost atmosphere of the sun that you can't see unless the sun is eclipsed. And today we have modern spacecraft images of this nature, right, to make comparison. And finally, this area on the left that's this that we've just been visiting this panel here. This area on the left goes into a little cavern here. That's the human scale of it. There's grinding basins and other significant features. And if you look out to the southwest where he's looking, you have a two half month predictive marker of the winter solstice sunset, which occurs out here. This is the about a half a month half a moon before the winter solstice sunset, which occurs here. So on both sides, that this strengthens the interpretation of that petroglyph as a sun watching type of phenomenon, because each side of this rock complex has probable horizon markers that may be significant. And she'd be perhaps you could say just a few words about the idea of a predictive marker um, being, being important and significant in light of the they, they marked the solstices, but most important to them was to understand when they were going to happen so they could predict them. That's a site that we will call calendrical. It's like uh, we look at the calendar today to know how many shopping days till Christmas or when our birthday is and all of that. They needed to know it so that the ceremonies could unfold properly and then they could uh, bring the sun back into the sky. So these predictive markers, there are at least eight in the canyon that are right around two weeks or half a moon. So that seems to be a, nothing for a right. Hours, right? <laughs> yeah, but that that is a very strong pattern. A Hopi man told us once, if you have two of them, you've got something scientific. Well, there are at least eight in the canyon, and two of them are right here that you're looking at now. Well, also the proximity of all these solar symbols, even the big spiral, is that not associated? Because in Pahada Butte, you've got the sun dagger either piercing it in the middle or framing it on the sides to do with the, the sun's uh, movement. So isn't the spiral associated with a solar? So you've got a lot of solar associated symbols all in, clustered in one place. Does that help? Yes, it's a little tricky to, to say that a spiral means something about the sun because many of them uh, have no indication of that. Right. And it's there's been many different, many different interpretations, but certainly the spiral is, as Jane Colbert, the archivist who's been studying uh, uh, rock art all over the world has told us, it's the most ubiquitous symbol that we see throughout the world, spirals. The human hand, yeah, and the human hand is the most representative. Yeah, and also you have to have time to prepare for those big ceremonies. So exactly. You need, yeah, you need those couple weeks to That's get. That's right, and yeah. this picture shows you again the sun setting in that position, and not the best of pictures because we had clouds, but it's very clear that the uh, sun's disk is going right down into that most prominent part uh, of the landscape from that uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and Laura, your comment, uh, you know, and GBs makes, we also uh, have a Hopi man who says, you know, if you talk to a Hopi about the sun, you talk about the moon, you talk about the moon, they think about the sun. So that the sun and moon are both playing in with these predictive markers. That's why I've been using the term half a moon, half a month, half a moon, right? Mm -hmm. The time it takes the, uh, you know, the moon to go around the earth once is a, is a month. And they're looking for potentially, uh, Kim Melville had that to say, you know, they're paying attention because moonlight matters for walking movement in the desert. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because that, they're transporting, they're not riding horses, you know, they're walking in from very long distances. And so have, you know, be in the hot, you know, or cold desert, you, you know, especially for, you know, you want to be able to walk in, the, in the, you know, in moonlight, uh, if you can, especially in the hotter parts. Well, and also and orient yourself in the middle of the night to the moon, if you know its cycles. Yeah. You mentioned the 18.6 uh, year cycle of the moon, the larger cycle. In the Robert Redford video that you recommended that we're listing, um, and both videos are so worth watching, they mentioned the cycle and also the moon rises. According to that very long cycle, that's not readily evident. Um, that's not well known even today. So they're also marking the significant moon rises in this much longer cycle. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? Well, we certainly have, a, as Sherilyn showed earlier, chimney rock, which seems um, beyond debate, actually, that the building was placed there in part to commemorate that cycle of the moon. Uh, from the point of view of that building, the sun will never rise through those two spires. Only the moon does so, and does so every 18.6 years. Uh, the cycle carries the moon farther out, both north and south, than the sun ever gets. And that's at that point, it's called the major standstill position. And uh, the fact that they noticed that at Chimney Rock suggests highly that it was important to them. Because as I said earlier, the building phases, uh, the dates, of the building coincide with that lunar cycle. So it seems very clear that they were enamored with that cycle of the moon. There's no question that they watched the phases of the moon month after month. That's not debatable by, not debated by anybody. The cycle, the larger cycle is a little more uh, controversial, but Chimney Rock is just, it, it's one of the greatest coincidences in the entire universe if that was not, you know, uh, uh, conscious on their part. And also the, the, you know, the Rinconada Eastern Horizon that we showed you in that, in the picture where you were, you were trying to discern where your sun would rise on your birthday. There are two horizon features outside of the uh, winter and summer solstice sunrise positions that are significant horizon features where the full moon rises during the standstill or the moon rises during the standstill period. That's upcoming also. It's left and if eclipses, two eclipses, uh, you know, uh, solar activity peak, uh, and uh, you know, is not enough for you in the coming decade. The lunar standstill, you only get a few in your lifetime. The lunar standstill is coming up here in the next decade between 2023 and 2026. That moonrise will be visible through the chimney rock. Uh, and also at Rinconada, those moon rises occurring outside. You can imagine how fascinating that would be. They watch the sun year after year and they're noticing that the moon is rising outside of those extreme boundaries, north and south on the eastern horizon where the winter and solstice sun are rising. So it, it's, I, I'm, I've, intuitively as a human being, it's like I cannot <laughs> imagine, right, that they were not aware of that. Um, whether or not the moon shadows on the Fahara Butte are clearly designating that. I, I myself have not, of course, seen that. But it is, I agree with the GB that it's, it's impossible to believe that they weren't uh, somehow, uh, you know, they're keen observers, more so than we moderns, and they had to have they, known it. They had that sky every night to watch. Yeah, they, right. weren't, they weren't inside watching TV or movies, they were watching this. <laughs> that's right. No, that's they were outside, you know, connecting with this stuff. And that is really a great finishing point. Laura, you're so masterful, right? To, to really just say, coming around full circle with why Chaco can be so inspirational is when you pay attention and, you know, stand and witness these astronomical phenomena in particular that we know they did and yeah. we can connect right, uh, across time, space, and culture that way. I actually think our fascination with watching movies and watching television is a replacement of what we used to do sitting around the campfire and spinning those mythologies, mm -hmm. spinning those tales and assigning to the constellations, these are the characters uh, on their life path, their migrations, their journeys, their adventures. Um, I think that's still embedded within us. We're just using poor substitutes for that, mm -hmm. so. 
Well, maybe we take a couple of questions and a couple yeah, comments. Yeah, do. There's been quite a bit of discussion in the chat room, and I'm not able to go back through everything, but um, <clears throat> because I, I let's start uh, with Christine. Well, Christine made a, an interesting comment about negative space, and, and then oh, Fred, and Fred was engaged, and he was talking to Christine. I said, "Well, let's just have Christine, yeah, Christine, Christine and jump Fred on, and then Fred, us. you can jump on, and and then anybody else, of course." And uh, yeah, and then uh, Monica raised her hand, so. Uh, yeah, Christine, you want to go first? Oh, I just as I was listening to Cheryl Lynn, I thought, wow, that sounds like stuff I heard through a person um, who was born and raised in Zuni, but not Zuni himself, and that the negative space is so powerful and so important. And he wants to explain to it, like some of their basketry with the whole, it's not just about spirit release, it's the, the flow of that and the, the mysteries within the negative, that they spend a lot of time concerned about that, that unbuilt natural state in the universe. Mm. That's, be that's beautiful, Christine. Thank you for, for amplifying that. You know, His we name is Mickey Vanderwagen. His parents were the original traders in Zuni. And so I'm not sure how old Mickey is now, but he he has to be getting up there in age. I'm, I'm guessing if he's still alive, he's he's an older gentleman now, very knowledgeable. He actually nice. went to Nuevo Casas Grandes and helped the traditional jewelry makers of um, in Casas Grandes get their jewelry tradition um, up and running. And he makes they make traditional um, jewelry like what Zuni made in the 1930s and 40s. So it's actually stunning jewelry, but he was teaching them how to do the Zuni craft. Um, but he's very knowledgeable. Two, two, so that, that amplifies that point and two other things that have come up, you know, with visitors of visual artists, you know, really paying attention to the, the, the space between the things, right, in terms of right. how they're rendering. And a musician, Right, the Absolutely. space between the notes is as important to the music yeah. as the note itself. Right, and so there's, there's lots of wonderful analogies, right, to to make with that, bringing our modern consciousness more into the importance of that. You know, we tend in the Western world to be more thing oriented, but if I, I invite people to to go into your world and you know, here's a cup. What's more important, the the ceramic or the space? The empty space, you know, for holding your cup. This is the Ranger's Yoda cup. <laughs> yeah, but, no, that, yeah. yeah, the negative space is really important. And I think Frederick was probably alluding to that as well that um, so many traditions in the world, it's really the negative space, or that, that what we think as nothing is so much more than nothing. Yes. There's a lot going on in it that we don't understand. Well, let's take it right back to physics and you yeah. tear apart that supposed space. There's nothing there, um, but it's all yeah. everything. Nothing is something, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Frederick, what did you, what was this discussion you were having with Christine? Can you share it with uh, us? It's interesting. Well, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, right. oh, right. Look, right. Right. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was asking, I was asking him, in fact, I said, what did you think of that petroglyph? Is it a parrot? <laughs> Uh, and what did he what say? Yeah. What did he say? But of course, what do you, why would anybody think anything else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a done deal. Oh, that's wonderful. What's the name of the period, Fred? Please remind me. Papageno. Papageno? Yes. Named after a character from Mozart's Magic Flute who grew, who dressed up as a parent. Of course. Of course. And, um, we all knew that reference. And he knows the Mozart opera arias as well. That said, um, uh, yes, the notion of negative space, I, I see it everywhere, but in, in throughout the world, but also it's important. Uh, one of the things that, that also I think that maybe Chris brought up was um, uh, the uh, somebody else. Oh, God, so much, so much for this. Thank you, GB and, uh, and Cheryl, and this is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I missed the first part because I, I had to be on another Zoom meeting. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, I guess my, uh, about the, this, the little six or seven circles, whatever it was on that petroglyph, mm -hmm. which, I, which I did mention in the chat, was very similar to these mounds up on the Mississippi and here in Iowa, in Northwest Iowa, mm -hmm. north, north, northeastern uh, county of Iowa, um, uh, right, I mean, just high overlooking the Mississippi. Um, and uh, I, every time I go to that place, which I must have been there probably 10 times, 
So I, I, I go there and I just sort of stand there and sort of meditate on what could this be? There's these interconnecting uh, mounds. They're, they're not flat, but they're mounds, maybe several feet high, each one. Um, and there's about seven of them slightly tilted down, down a, a shallow hill. And I thought, well, what is this? But the, the thing is that uh, the seeing, see this same imagery at Chaco suggests to me that, uh, that there's a whole lot more that goes on in, in North America, uh, that there would have been this diffusional uh, uh, physiology or whatever it is that we don't know much about because so much of it has disappeared. And there's really not any kind of textuality that takes us back there, but for us to, to kind of guess at what was going on based on a single, a single remain, whether it's at effigy or at uh, Chaco or whatever, I, I think we, you know, I think there's a lot of this stuff. So, and and perhaps it's all there in in, in different kind of site reports and so on. I, I maybe Chris knows more about that. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's really. It's really cool. Thank you, Fred. And we look forward to you and Christine and Judy uh, on our panel next Sunday. Next right. Sunday on the yeah, topic. Where yeah. we tackle the topic of shamans. shamans. Yeah. That would be fun, too. So all really of you, diving come on into back. this. Come on back next Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I want Monica's also uh, on uh, hands up. Did you want to add to the discussion? Hey, Monica. Hi. Um, this is just uh, it's so exciting to listen to. Um, everything that you're talking about, Sherilyn and GB, and, and um, also to see the kind of comments and conversation that come up in this context. And I would just like to add in here that it wasn't known in, throughout any of this time um, that uh, the ancients and were, were developing what, what we could call symbolic imagination, putting, um, you know, making this, this cave art and this wall, you know, rock art, um, they were deepening um, it, into a symbolic consciousness, and it wasn't known then that the universe itself was time developmental. That that it actually, I mean, we didn't know that till you know it was it speculated in the 1920s, and then you know even when quantum physics and special relativity came about, it wasn't known that the universe itself is developing. And so a lot what they were doing with their symbolic imagination is deepening their own consciousness to be able to depict in images i mean they're not they they were different they too are developing humanity has developed it didn't always have symbolic imagination and so here we are now knowing that it's a time developing universe looking back on what they did then and that's amazing to me i mean it just blows my mind that we are deepening into, you know, in the same way that they were looking at um, GB, you said, um, evoking the order of the universe back into the earth by looking at these patterns that had been laid down um, over time in the developing universe where the sun's always going to rise in this place on this day, et cetera, and it's going to go back and forth in the equinox. They're, they're looking at the motion of displacement throughout the universe and, and recognizing all the patterns. But now that we know that as a time developing universe, there's another type of motion that we can see that they couldn't see then. And it's the motion of development, it's the complexification. And, and so, you know, to imagine them there developing symbolic consciousness, um, and tell it with myths and telling stories that are coming through them. It, it wasn't even the eye in it. They were just telling stories, uh, oh, the same stories. And then at some point, the modern theorem, theoretic mind develops, and now we have an I. And we begin speaking about what I, I am in the universe, and it does separate us. We do get into the modern period, we get completely separated from the natural world. But now we have this incredible opportunity to go back into that through That's development right. and and um, and through experience. So yes. now it's the human exploring and deepening into a new experience, one that is as important as the development of the power of symbolic imagination in the first place. And Laura, you spoke about it too. You said, 
I see what we're doing now by watching TV and doing all, you know, that it's a new kind of development. It's like we're dreaming the together. Impulse. Mm -hmm. Dreaming together in the dark in our new way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so Monica, that's, that's I, I, so beautiful and uh, my integral sister. And um, uh, yeah, it, you know, we, we need to talk more. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, you know, this is why you take, the, I, I, my way of expressing this visually is to say we take that spiral off the rock wall Right. It's it, it's not only the cyclic and the cyclic and the way of the pattern on the horizon, but now the developmental dimension spirals it. So right. So we, we can come back to Chaco. You know, we're circling, we're cycling, we go back to nature and reconnect. But it's not like we're going back to that time. Consciousness has evolved. Right. And so we're spiraling forward. We go around and around in the cycle combined with the developmental trajectory right the patterns out a spiral right of of the evolution of of consciousness and so that that those ideas th thrill me and i do yeah I include them implicitly right and i i feel that you do do that it's the development of the whole centered on us now you know right. i don't really feel it which is why i get shivers listening to the whole thing and the responses and all about the empty space because the empty space is where that's felt mm -hmm. you know it's, thank it's, you uh, yeah. well also what i like is the sense that it is our duty as humans to participate in creation so we need to do the ceremonies so that the sun will come back we need to be the the moral uh, upholders of the patterns of the universe, of the order. We need to bring it down into our culture, not only participatory, but also uh, maintain the ways of the ancestors. And the ancestors not just being our grandmothers and grandfathers and through the human lineage, but it looks like the ancestors are all of life, the whole web of life. And so we're connected that way. That's how it reads to me as well. So... That's yes, in my, in my experience of uh, going to these places to see the sunrise, just doing that takes me into a sense of catching up with the ancient people in terms of their intuitive sense of what was going on. Uh, my intellect can talk about it in all kinds of ways that I've learned in uh, my study of astronomy and physics and whatever, but there's something missing and going and standing and watching the sunrise allows me to catch up to those ancient people and, and feel it in such a way that it now becomes more embodied. It's more of a part of who I am than just the thoughts I have about the universe. The thoughts can help construct it and can help articulate it, but without that sense of embodiment, they're empty words. Well, that is the ritual of going and actually watching the sunrise and being participatory. And they were in there here and now. They were saying, I am adding this action now to continue the story forward. So they were not just hearkening to their past, but they were bringing it forward into the future and, and helping that developmental. Um, but, you know, the, the, yes, and the lens that, that Monica puts on it, um, in the, what GB just said, is what allows a, a, a you know a hyper rationally trained scientist right to find access into the portal that what you are bringing back alive you know in in Dr. Goodman's work in regards to hey there is some duty to participate in ceremony we've made that into you know that the rational world has kind of made that into something woo woo or you know that we're, we're we've graduated beyond that. Uh, no, we haven't yet graduated to the place where we transcend that, but we now come back and include it mm. and, and find out what it is that we, we were missing, right? And so I think that it's, it's, it's very important for us to, to go and include that uh, Monica in code, I'll say purple, <laughs> right? right? To, to, to experience that as a, as a holistic human being in today's world. We don't need to be severed from these, these gems of of practices and wisdom from the past. Well, just as it was important for you to have naked eye observation oh. of the night sky, as opposed to just being there in your lab or your, your yeah. 
So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for exactly. bringing it back yeah. down to why the Kareem Mungay Institute exists and why mm -hmm. it's creating a space for us to get back to that ancestral direct knowledge on a universal level. We had to return so. to including yeah. the experiential as part of the scientific documentation. And so we, there was a dismissiveness for a while, and yeah. now we've come back around where we're saying, wait a minute, the two worlds come together, like Cheryl Lynn talked about being able to have the naked eye experience versus the classroom experience and, 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 and achieving yeah. all the different degrees of education and yet not having the hands-on. So, But it makes the whole experience of life so much more rich and intimate and personal mm -hmm. and relational. Um, let's have a direct relationship with this universe yeah. uh, in this way. Those ancient people, they knew a thing or two, didn't they? I just, I just want to add real quick that, that if we, the, about the morality of it, if we don't bring ourselves deeply into alignment with earth and universe processes, then we have rituals that, that are really destructive instead of rituals and practices that deepen that relationship. I mean, our rituals become going to Disneyland and things like that, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Boy, I, I mean, we, we couldn't pay you guys enough to say these things. It's like, we're, we're, <laughs> thank you for validating our thank existence you for the here. Validation that we exist. We exist, Laura Lee. The Queer Among Institute exists. We're doing yeah. something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I just want to say that this kind of a conference discussion pre-COVID pre would require you to buy airline tickets, to make sure you get your food, your preparation, your travel, your taxi cabs all lined up, <laughs> and you would spend thousands of dollars to have access to this kind of detailed information that <laughs> Cheryl Lynn and GB have uh, provided with us today. You have to go to Chaco. There, there's no other place for it. Well, even in Chaco, you don't get this kind of detail because the, the time yeah. is limited. The, the, yeah. we, we, they're taking us beyond the introductory. The introductory is available online in videos. This goes beyond the introductory phase of understanding Chaco. And now we're getting into the nitty gritty and we're starting to understand the, the, the deeper significance, meanings. the deeper meanings. Uh, yeah. And for me, and I've said my story before, so I'll keep it, I won't go there. Go ahead, but, just because no, but for Sherilyn me, that, referenced it's experiential. It, so. And so my experience yeah. from going to Chaco the first time for two or three days was life-changing. It's shift the path of my life and why I'm the director of this institute today. So um, I just want to say that um, the two worlds, it, it's been so significant to us to have this come together. And GB had this experience of not, not three days, but 33 years <laughs> of walking the paths of the ancients and looking at the structures of, of connecting to the stars. That is something that the rest and of us Sherilyn can And Sherilyn was there and as well. I know, Sherilyn, for 15 yeah. years. So yeah, yeah, I understand that. And So can and, you speak in summary, uh, Sherilyn yes. and GB, can you speak to what the experience was like? You've been off path. You've been to where the tourists don't get to go. You've been spending months at a time, years at a time, decades at a time, GB, there. What was that like to live there and in just summary. rock? <laughs> Sherilyn used the word rock before. 25 oh, words or less. Rock that. Just as way of well, the book. <laughs> interesting life you two have led. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I can't say too much about how it has changed my life. And um, I really um, understand it in ways of, that are hard to articulate. When I went to Chaco the first time and I was enamored by the night sky and the study of archaeoastronomy, uh, something else happened within a few years that it felt like to me that um, I was being accepted by the canyon to be its servant uh, more than um, being able to tell everybody about what it means. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I draw upon the research, I draw upon the myths and the stories from the descendants. I draw upon all of that, but the real, uh, uh, the real attempt I make in my interpretation is to allow people to have their own experience that brings them in to intimate connection with the natural world, as you can see there, because it is a remote enough place that people come out there and they just wonder, why did these people choose this place? And that is the, the question. We do not know why they chose Chaco because it was not the easiest place. They had a choice of many other places where there were rivers running through it, not in Chaco, they chose one of the most difficult places and then they spread out and brought all their needs there. Why did they do that? 
there are buildings that were built like 30 miles from the source of the cliffs out of which they cut the bricks. This is not convenience going on here. There's something else. But you get this sense of connection to the natural world that you just don't get easily and certainly don't get inside of a city. And there's something about that that changes people's lives. It's not for me to tell them what the meaning is as much as just offer them stories. This is what I've heard. This is what this researcher says. But to take them into a place where they can have that connection, that's the most important thing to me because that's my experience. Well said. Well and that said. experience is so accessible there, so rich. It just hits you between the eyes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just uh, yeah, and then uh, to you. Tony Hull uh, chimed in as well with a wonderful answer. yes. So as I saw well, that he said, I told you. crunching travel gives me the marvelous experience of watching the sun move across the horizon at sunrise and sunset. Although I've had worked with the largest telescopes, my greatest connection to the night sky is out in the desert on a dark night with a pair of binoculars. I live in New Mexico because of Chaco. <laughs> So, and Tony, right. I want to thank Me you too. for the introductions to yeah. Fred Smith and Sherilyn and GB yeah, and that's true. Everybody all of in the that. Room. Yeah, thank you, Tony, for thank being the connector. <laughs> <laughs> Although we got to sit with you uh, before we met Tony and have tea with you and meet you at Chaco, GB. So that was yeah. really a delight. We met, yes. we, yeah. we met GB in 1993, our very first trip there, 94. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so. Okay, kids. Well, There's Monica. There's Monica. Other people are... Moving. Here's Fred. I, oh, she's muted. Monica, you're muted. So, hmm. but uh, thank you for the brilliant presentation, uh, GB and uh, Sherilyn. Thank you for all the wonderful research and sharing it, and all the dedication and the extensive time that you put out there and sharing your stories with us to bring some of that magic uh, home to us and to help lure us all out there. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for convening this conversation. These are these are rich and marvelous. I look forward to next week's uh, presentation with uh, what that was described. Um, yeah, it's it's brilliant to have more time to dive in deeper. Well done. Yeah. Well, and, and, and without repeating myself, as we began the presentation today, we said that no institute can stand alone. We need to invite research that goes way beyond what we research to help understand what it is that we are researching that we can validate verify and grow as an organization and We're, create relationships and create relationships and create relationships so i want Yay, relationship relationship, <laughs> relationship. <laughs> and i'm going to unmute everybody for a moment so everybody should say goodbye and thank you to our guests let me see uh go to more hey, thank you lots of people have been up. Thank you. Everybody say goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, this is highly nice. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Peace. Good help. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye-bye. Right. Yeah. Right. See you all these beautiful you. faces. Bye. Nancy. Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Nico is there. Noemi is there. Bill. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amy. Bob. Yeah. 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 There's Tony. Hi, Tony. Liz. <laughs> Hello, Tony. Sorcha. Hi, Tony. Katsina. Bill Rolf. Lisa. Carrie. Yeah. Look at that. Beautiful faces. Uh, Vijay. Gupta. Ah. Yeah. Hey. Namaste. Oh, oh, Vijay. Hey, Good to see you. Hey. 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 Okay. We're going to be talking to you. Via I'll be well. Judith, Roderick, yep. Look at that beautiful Bill, Maya. Blessings. <laughs> I'll be well and safe. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Phil, look at that. Phil on the left. Right. Yeah, hello. Bye bye, everyone. Oh, bye bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Peace. Rosina, <laughs> yay. Thank you too so much. We appreciate your dedication to time <laughs> and putting together an extremely tight professional presentation to bring us all up to oh, speed. Oh, just the stories. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic.